So I'd like to welcome you uh, and hope you're having a great day. It's my pleasure um, to be here this evening. I am Michael Feltner. I am the Interim Dean at Seaver College. And on behalf of the faculty, staff, and students at Seaver, I want to thank you for attending this evening's third lecture in the 2014-2015 W. David Baird Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, before beginning this evening's program and introducing Ms. Duckworth, I want to acknowledge uh, the Dean Emeritus of Seaver College and the, and the individual for whom this lecture series is named, uh, former Dean David Baird. David? The format for this evening will be as follows. Uh, following her introduction, Ms. Duckworth will speak for approximately 45 minutes. Uh, she is committed to concluding her lecture no later than 6 p.m. So if you're someone in the audience who has a 6 o'clock class this evening, we would ask that you please wait until the conclusion of the lecture before leaving to attend your class. After a brief pause to accommodate those who will be departing, uh, we will have a question and answer period. And I would like to strongly encourage you to please remain for the Q&A period is that is often uh, one of the great opportunities at these lectures to engage on questions of personal interest. So please take advantage of that time and stay with us for the Q&A. Also while we are assembled and before we start this evening's lecture, I want to make you aware of two other significant lectures in the very near future. Two weeks from tonight in this very room, Michael Poland will present the fourth and final uh, lecture in this year's Dean's Lecture Series. Uh, Dr. Poland is speaking on Omnivore's Dilemma, Searching for the Perfect Meal in a Fast Food World. He is widely published author. Uh, that is a ticketed event, and so we encourage you to go to the Smothers Theater box office to attend that lecture and get a ticket. And on February 9 and 10, the Veritas Forum will be on our campus, and we have Michael Ramsden of the Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics delivering talks in Firestone Fieldhouse on the evening of the 9th and the 10th, and I encourage you to uh, attend those talks, and I'm grateful for your attendance this evening. Introducing our speaker tonight is Dr. Dean Bame. Dr. Bame is a professor of economics and finance, and he's an internationally recognized expert on professional sports stadium financing. <clears throat> In addition to his contributions as an educator and a scholar, Dean is currently serving as the chairperson of the Business Administration Division. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bain. Uh, Connie K. Duckworth uh, is an example of what we would uh, hope our business administration graduates will become. Uh, after getting her MBA at Wharton, uh, Ms. Duckworth became the first woman to be named a sales and trading partner in the history of Goldman Sachs. Uh, in 2001, she retired as a managing director of the firm to focus on being a social entrepreneur. In 2004, Ms. Duckworth founded Arzu. Arzu means hope in Dari. Uh, and at its founding, it employed uh, 30 destitute rural Afghani women as weavers. Uh, some 10 years later, our zoo employed 700 Afghans, uh, creating award-winning fair labor rugs. Uh, these 700 employees have access to education and basic health care. Uh, the larger community is enhanced by an our zoo operated woman center, preschool, and parks. In short, Arzu has grown into a learning laboratory for holistic grassroots economic development. Besides Arzu, Ms. Duckworth uh, remains active in the corporate world, serving on the board of directors for Steelcase and Russell Investments. She's also on the board of trustees for uh, Northwestern Mutual Life. Ms. Duckworth also serves as a trustee for the University of Pennsylvania and overseer of the Wharton School, as well as a board member of the Interfaith Youth Corps in Chicago. Ms. Duckworth is, re, uh, is a recipient of numerous awards uh, for leadership, advocacy, social impact, and innovation. Unfortunately, Ms. Duckworth is not a graduate of her business program. She earned her bachelor's degree at the University of Texas. 
Um, please give a warm wave welcome to Connie K. Duckworth. Thank you, Dean, very much for that kind and overly long introduction. Um, but I am delighted to be here tonight. And um, I clearly missed out by not coming to school in Malibu, California. Um, but I'm always glad to be here. I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge a couple of uh, attendees, uh, including my very first boss and mentor at Goldman Sachs. Um, who is sitting there, who lives across the canyon. And the first time I saw um, Pepperdine was from the backyard of the Clark's house. And they, Helen, his wife, would say, oh, I swim over at that pool. And so that was probably about uh, 1981, I would say. So uh, it's wonderful to be back. But thank you, Steve, and my former colleague, Mike, for coming tonight. And um, I have to say that the example that he set for me as a new person right out of school, a real newbie, and new to the investment world and certainly new to Wall Street, um, I think set the tone of how my career then unveiled. And so I think the moral of this story, and one that I learned from Steve, is that you always need to pay it back and pay it forward, because what you do um, is really like dropping uh, a pebble in a pond. Uh, ripples will, will move out, and you never really will know, in most cases, where they end up washing ashore. So the key is to make sure you're continually dropping pebbles into that pond to stir things up. So tonight, I thought I would divide my talk into uh, really two parts my business career, and then the evolution of that into social entrepreneurship. Because I can assure you that when I was an undergraduate student, I never, never envisioned myself spending the bulk of my business career on Wall Street. That was an opportunity that came knocking. And um, what I like to tell people, especially students who are starting out, is that opportunity um, always tends to knock at strange times. And you may think they're also at very inconvenient times. But some of the best um, paths that you will take are paths that you didn't necessarily plan out, that they just evolved and happened. Um, and then the, the uh, second part really relates to this idea of service. And um, you at this school are very much um, ingrained, service is an ingrained um, rather than acquired, uh, I think, activity. And as uh, examples of service are really from the beginning of your studies here throughout your career and uh, as a student. And I urge you to continue that um, as you go forward in life. Because one of the things that you'll see is that how the way in which you serve and the time you uh, put into service will vary very much it will be a sort of a rhythm, but it will vary over the course of your life. And there are times when, uh, more so as students, when you have seemingly lots of time, um, even if you don't think you do, you do, um, and, but relatively little money. And then there are times when you're uh, working in the business world and you may feel like you have absolutely no time, but relatively speaking, a lot of money. There are times when you have neither, and then there are happy times when you have this uh, sort of overlap of both time and money. And at each stage of those, there's something that you expressly can do, <clears throat> excuse me, to make the world a better place. And I think that each of us is put, put here to do our part. And I'm convinced that uh, from what I've seen from my own work um, in Afghanistan on other nonprofit boards, that if each one of us just did that one thing, whether it's small or big, that is within our grasp that we are capable of doing at that moment, whether it's volunteering your time, pulling out your checkbook and writing a check, um, getting very engaged in a strategic plan for a nonprofit, um, or, or simply um, showing up to assist another person. Whatever it is that's within your gra grasp, just do that one thing. Because if each of us did that one thing, 
then this world would have a tsunami of social change. And it certainly is in need of uh, such. It's, uh, the world's gotten to be a very small place, a very interconnected place, and uh, seemingly a very dangerous place. So uh, it's, it behooves all of us to do our part on that. So let me quickly uh, retrace. I had the, with such a, a detailed introduction, lovely introduction, I don't need to spend a lot of time on my career, but I'll, I'll give you a couple of lessons that I've learned. I did spend roughly 20 years on Wall Street, and um, I, for much of that career, um, was typically the only one in the room. And it was a uh, uh, fun, invigorating, exciting. Um, I feel like I'm a normal looking person, but I actually have skin as thick as a rhinoceros, and I came by that honestly, layer by layer. But, um, but I have to say that the uh, aspect of my career on Wall Street that really excited me was the fact that I was on a, on a big learning curve. It was a real growth trajectory. Every day, it was almost like I came into my job and was in school again. And I was learning from my colleagues, from my clients, from uh, reading material, from current events. And my job was to meld all that information and to come up with some, some decisions. And so I learned a lot of life skills in that job, which have served me very well. Um, certainly as a, as a parent, I have four children. And um, when I was working full time with four small children, prioritization and time management were really key skills. Well, that is probably the uh, s figuring out how to manage your time, because time is your scarcest resource as you move through your career and your life. I would say balance that, uh, learn how to prioritize, and that will put you so far ahead of the game. I also learned that um, what goes around does come around, and everyone you meet, well, we have a saying at Goldman Sachs, everyone, it's called the three C's. Everyone you meet will come back in life as a client, a colleague, or a competitor. Now, I would expand that to a few other categories, but the, uh, the, the saying is basically at its core true. People that you see, uh, that you think you will never see again, magically appear in front of you in a position of authority and maybe you weren't so nice to them at that particular moment in time. Um, so I, that's one of the lessons I drum into my kids is remember the three C's. Everyone comes back in your life. And I think part of it's age, but it, it just does happen more and more. But I think it, in, in today's world, there are any number of career paths that I think are, are equally as exciting and new. You've got technology. You have uh, entrepreneurship. Um, venture capital, private equity. There are many, many different careers. Um, I am, uh, you know, we all speak to or see the world through our own lens. And mine is a lens of business. And so I naturally feel that uh, I'm very, um, I feel very strongly that a business career is a, is a great path to take because you learn real life skills the private sector, in my opinion, is a very strong force for global good. And it is the generator of jobs. And as you'll see as I migrate into my presentation about Afghanistan, I firmly believe, and I've learned this over the 10 years of work in Afghanistan, that um, having a job and being able to support one's family and oneself is really a human right. I think it is a basic human right because so much stems from the ability to stand on your own two feet and to take care of your family. Um, and I have many examples of that uh, as I walk through this. So I spent 20 years on Wall Street, um, learned a great deal, had my family and my children, and was in New York for 9-11. And that was a very impactful moment. I had already, I was at that point in time, commuting Monday through Friday. I lived in Chicago. I had been transferred from Los Angeles to Chicago. I lived in Chicago, and I would go to work at 6 a.m. on the plane on Monday, and I'd come back whatever time you got out of LaGuardia on Friday night. And so I was already thinking that this is not a sustainable situation. Um, and then I was there for 9-11, and I was able to get in a car 
with um, a man who was president of another investment firm in Chicago. And uh, it was almost like one of those wartime experiences. We drove 850 miles in like 10 or 12 hours. I mean, we had the pedal to the metal. We stopped twice for McDonald's and to fill up our gas. And when my husband took the car back the next day, he said, my gosh, he said, this is worse than a college road trip. I've never seen so much junk in the back seat. I said, we weren't stopping for anything. So um, that was the, I took it as a sign that it was time for me to do something different and to change from, and I feel like I contributed in many ways during my business career. I mentored many, many young professionals, um, many, both men and women. And I feel very proud when I see many people who work for me um, over the years becoming the people that are running the place. And so it's, it's, uh, that's an exciting sense of, of giving back. But I wanted to do something different. And I wanted to devote my time to, as well as my sort of uh, intellectual interest, to giving back. And I had been following Taliban abuse of women for a number of years because women's rights has always been my personal uh, soapbox and my passion. And so I'd been naturally following it in the press as best I could. And then I retired, and about three months later, I got a call from a friend in Washington who said, oh, by the way, I put your name in for something. You might get a call. And I said, well, what's that? And she said, well, the State Department's putting together a bipartisan commission to help make sure that women in Afghanistan have a seat at the table post-Taliban. And they needed a business representative. She said, so I said, oh, call Connie Duckworth. She just retired. She's really into these women's things, and she has plenty of time. <laughs> so, but wasn't that fortunate? That was one of those unanticipated knocks at the door that really changed the trajectory of what I would spend more than the last decade doing. So I'm eternally grateful to this friend for having thought to put my name in the hopper, and I'm grateful that I was selected for this. The interesting, um, this, this uh, organization is called the U.S. Afghan Women's Council, and it started with probably four or five civilians, someone representing social justice, someone representing education, health care, I was business. And we went together with government people on a military plane for the first time in January of 2003 into Kabul, Afghanistan. And that's the uh, first time I had ever been on a helicopter and particularly the first time that I'd ever been on a helicopter where the sides are open and guys with machine guns are hanging out as you fly. And you don't fly that high, and you make a lot of noise. So it was a very interesting and strange trip, um, but it has really addicted me to this country that for 5,000 years has been at the crossroads of um, global empires and powers. Everybody who's been anybody has come through Afghanistan at some point or another, from Genghis Khan to Alexander the Great. We all know about the Russians and the British. And you look at this place, it's like the moon. And you're like, how can this be so strategic? Well, it just has been this little buffer that's absorbed a lot of shocks over time. So I went, not knowing, having any idea what I was going to do, uh, with my task of helping women have a seat at the table. But the seminal moment for me was when um, we were being driven around and there were a few donkey carts and a few ancient buses, but there was no car traffic at that time. And it looked like kind of what I envisioned Berlin after World War II to have looked like. It was all bombed. Not from either the Russians or the coalition, but really more so from this inner Nicene warfare, the civil war that took place that really uh, devastated the country. So um, on the way to the airport, we made one last stop, and it was to this uh, cinder block, ugly, Soviet-style uh, square building. So think gray, ugly. And Kabul is very high. It's like Colorado temperatures. And it was bombed. It had been bombed. So it was jaggedy, old cinder block. We go in, and there were dozens of widows who, in the Afghan society, if you have no male relative, even a, a son, 
you're really the bottom of the barrel. And there were dozens of widows and little kids living in this building with no heat, no facilities or running water, no nothing. And they had warned us there's no heat in this country. And this is January, so it's like 25 degrees. I had lived in Chicago. I know how to dress for 25 degrees. I had my thin slate boots, my long underwear, my Eddie Bauer down jacket, and I was freezing. And I'm looking down at the faces of these children, who were about the ages of my kids at that time, and they were wearing flip-flops. So I got back on that plane. I didn't know what time zone I was in, because I remember sleeping in my bed on Saturday night, and I remember sleeping in my bed the following Saturday night. I don't really remember sleeping. I certainly don't remember a bed any time in between. But um, I just thought about it the whole way back and said, I'm going to do something. And I don't know what that something is. Well, I came back, I did some research, and I concluded that women needed jobs today, meaning back in 2003. Not 10 years from now, in 2014, when the power grid's been built or the roads are in. Well, oh, by the way, there's still no roads and there's still no power grid. They needed jobs to put food on the table today. So after having done some research, the largest legal, emphasis on the word legal, export in the country is, the, is handmade rugs. They've been doing it forever. It's done in the home, not in a factory setting. And unfortunately, after trafficking, the rug industry is one of the most exploitive industries in the world of women and children. So people who are desperately poor will sell their children to unscrupulous producers. So I looked at this and said, hmm, this looks like it could use some restructuring of the supply chain. What we basically did was I set up a 501c3, we're legally a nonprofit here, we're a local NGO, non-governmental organization in Afghanistan. But from the very beginning, I said we're gonna run this thing like a business because our ultimate goal is to create a virtuous funding cycle where the sale of a product, which I had yet to identify, that could be sold in the export market competitively would then fund not only ethical <coughs> pay and fair labor practices, but also fund the creation of this, what I call an ecosystem of social support, which is, as described, basic education, basic health care, um, some clean water, we've experimented with housing, lots of different programs. Now, I started this in June of 2004. We've celebrated our 10th anniversary. We're still not profitable. There's still a gap. Now you think, hmm, that's a long time. And I'm saying, boy, am I with you. That is a long time to be doing this. But you have to be an optimist to work in Afghanistan. Hope does spring eternal. And uh, now with a new commercial partnership with the largest uh, manufacturer of rugs globally in the United States, who called us after reading about our um, rugs in the scintillating publication, Rug News and Design, which I'm sure you subscribe to, um, called the editor and said, you know what, I've seen nothing like this. And he produces in Nepal, India, China, and Pakistan. And I don't produce in Afghanistan, but I want to find out what this ethical production is about. So the point of this is I spent 20 years in business. I had a business, an MBA. I learned all those lessons. I loved my work. But at the end of it, I had a toolkit. And that toolkit, I redeployed all the same skills, time management, prioritization, budgets, um, you know, being creative, trying to, you know, a, a salesperson always gets told no. OK, no is just how do I go back and think about it, the problem a different way. And I've deployed all those in Afghanistan. So I want to give you a little bit of a of a tour. Arzu means hope, as you've been told, and it's also a common woman's name, which is why we picked it. So here's our conclusion after 10 years of work in Afghanistan. Jobs equal peace, and that is true anywhere in the world. And it goes back to my conviction that uh, work, the ability to work and to support one's family is a human right. Um, so that's the takeaway, and it works in Afghanistan, and it works in the south side of Chicago, and it'll work anywhere else you pick in the world. So it's talking about being grounded in reality. Real jobs mean real pay, 
putting real food on the table, providing real education. So I want to introduce you to one of our uh, weavers. Um, as you've heard about, we provide the, the ethical, uh, we have ethical production, which means fair labor jobs plus social benefits. But I want you to meet Zara, who is the 45-year-old mother of eight, uh, five daughters and three sons. Now, pre-Taliban, Zara and her family lived very comfortably on their farm, feeding themselves from their own production um, and livestock. But that life was destroyed by the Taliban, who burned their farm, and, the, when the, and then the family fled over the mountains into Pakistan as refugees. After eight years of struggle and hardship in a refugee camp, the family returned to a life that no longer existed. Their once lush land in Bamiyan province, which is where we operate, that's where we built our footprint, and that is the home of those dramatic and majestic Bamiyan Buddhas, the giant Buddhas that the Taliban blew up. Just the hillside that it has the niches where the Buddhas uh, formerly stood is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and it's quite spectacular. Their once lush land was now barren, and her husband could find no work um, in agriculture or farming. So Zara, who is a very skilled rug weaver, got work with just a random producer, one of the uh, old style supply chain guys. And here's a quote she says about it. No one can understand the pain of seeing your child starve and know that there's nothing to feed him. Rug weaving is a family tradition and I'm very good at it. But even when I wove big carpets, the money I was paid was mere pennies. So in 2006, um, Zara learned about Arzu, new to her village, and she has since reclaimed her life, her home, and her sense of self-worth. She says, Arzu came to our village and I joined the carpet weav weaving program. I've been working for Arzu ever since. Finally, there is hope for my family. With the money I've earned, we built a three-room home. We even have a TV, satellite dish, and computer. I am now literate. My children attend government schools. I send both my oldest daughter and son to university. Arzu is the window of hope for my family and me. Now, the first change in the trajectory of her life was coming to work not for pennies, for the labor that her exquisite labor, but for a reasonable wage. The second trajectory, change in trajectory, is the fact that she has children in the university. These were illiterate children and an illiterate rural mother who, through education, have broken through to an entire new realm and that son or daughter will have a different kind of opportunity opened and will be further helping to support their family. So here's outcomes. Having done this for 10 years, we collect a lot of data. So here are the key outcomes, but I just want to highlight a couple of them. Number one, this is an industry where we have to compete internationally, price-wise, with lots of product that's produced in um, rather unsavory conditions. And yet, our weavers earn almost 70% more, and they're rural women, than the per capita income of the country of Afghanistan. And that includes, that number includes men and urban areas where there are different kinds of jobs. 55% on their own home, as they have technology which opens their minds to the world. 100% of our weavers are literate, as are their families, in a country where 90% of rural women are still illiterate today, 10 years later. And I think one of my most, um, I think one of the statistics that I'm most proud of is that Afghanistan had the highest maternal death rate in the world. It was the number one issue that the uh, country was trying to address. And today, Still, one in every 50 women that deliver today in Afghanistan will die in childbirth. Rural women today, probably 90% of them, will never have any trained medical care. And so, what do we do? What's our maternal health program? Well, 
I think about that supply chain again, we're basically in logistics. We're like UPS. What do we do? We don't have hospitals, we don't have clinics, we don't have doctors. What we do is have a female chaperone. We require the family, if they want to weave for us and get the extra money, that w uh, they have to allow these women to be picked up with a chaperone, physically taken for pre and postnatal care, for deliveries, and taking the babies back for, child or, or for immunizations. That's all we do. We pick up, we track them, we deliver them. And that, since 2006, we have not lost a single mother or baby in childbirth in a country with still one of the highest maternal death rates in the world. So um, 10 years later, we're ranked by the government, uh, the Department of uh, Economy, the number one NGO in the region. There were probably, when the money was flowing big, that means other people's money, big government money. Um, there are probably 100 NGOs operating in this province. Today, there's maybe 25 or 30. So um, the tortoise definitely wins out when you're talking about international development practices. Here's Zara. Um, so here's a picture of ladies working in one of our women's centers on a big commercial loom because we it took about five years to build our base, to establish the quality. That's the year we won our first international design award, awards for the quality and design of our rugs. And it's also when we entered the commercial market, meaning the corporate market. So corporations build a big, bu big building. They all say they're socially responsible. Well, if I can get to the CEO and say, I read your website and I know you're socially responsible and I believe it. But did you know that after trafficking, dot, 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 all I need that guy to do is yell out to his assistant, tell him Arzu rugs, we can take it from there. And here's ladies working on rugs. This is just some pictures of the designs that we do. We started with traditional and tribal, and then went very modern. Um, what's funny about the modern patterns is that um, our weavers, when asked, what do you think of the foreign designs? Um, they say, well, really, they're quite easy, so we don't mind working on them. <laughs> um, I want to go back one slide. This rug on the, um, that one, the square one, is actually our, uh, sort of our signature piece. It's a copy of the oldest rug ever found in the world. The original is on display in the Hermitage. That original was carbon dated to 500 BC, which means the horses on this thing have been going around that rug for 2,500 years. That is uh, emblematic of our overarching mission and our view of sustainability, which we define as economic sustainability to self-fund over time, cultural and artistic sustainability, and environmental sustainability. And here are some of the awards that, uh, that we've won in that market. Um, you all, when you came in, I hope, received a Peace Cord bracelet. So here they are. This little product um, is, is a very other end of the spectrum. Not everybody is a skilled weaver. So I was challenged one day to, by someone in Afghanistan, well, what can you do, for, what kind of jobs can you create for women that don't have any skills? So we created part-time work for elderly, teenage girls who are still in school, um, uh, very pregnant women, some uh, disabled women, and that's what this, this little thing is. So when you wear this, you have to recognize that this has put food on someone's table. This has given them that dignity of work. This little thing, that's that pebble in the pond. So, um, and I want to tell you a story about one of our Peace Corps uh, weavers, Masuma. Now, Masuma is 18 years old, and she's from one of our villages in Bamiyan province. And while she's beautiful and smiling now, it, her life has um, not always been so happy. In the late 90s, after the Taliban murdered her father, she, along with her mother, grandmother, and six siblings, fled from her home in Bamiyan to Kabul, and then escaped from there to a refugee camp in Pakistan. The family returned in October of 2007, so they were gone eight, nine years, and that's when Masuma's mother and grandmother joined our program. And although Masuma was of the age to enroll in government school, 
she had missed too much. She was too far behind the grade level that she should have entered. And so that was the point at which we decided to establish as part of this ecosystem of support, um, fast track classes to get girls who should have been in fifth grade into fifth grade so they could continue their education. And she and her siblings were able then to start school. She says, when I learned that I could not go to school, I was heartbroken. I thought it would never be anything but a burden to my family. I feared that my mother would force me to get married as soon as I was of age, which could be like 12. Um, thank God for Arzu. Arzu is still here and still helping my family and me. I'm now enrolled in English classes. With education, I do not need to be blinded in life. So last year, Masuma started weaving Peace Court's a part-time job after school. She's very proud that she can help her mother cover daily expenses and help with the cost of her sibling's education. And she says, as a wage earner, I'm a contributor rather than a burden to my family. When a person works and earns her own money, it automatically gives her power in the family. I have this power now. And I think that's one of the outcomes that we truly see as we track our families through time, is as the women assume their, um, uh, st they, they assume a new, there's a new balance of power in the household. They, they rise in prestige. They are listened to more. They have more say over what happens in their household and to their children. And we've now started English and computer classes. We have a small computer center. And um, our first class of ladies is now fluent in the Microsoft Office suite. So if you need an Excel spreadsheet run, these are the gals. But the most important lesson, again, is that it's this sense of self-worth. And empowered women raise empowered kids. And we see this in less than a generation the expectations that the girls themselves, they want to be teachers, they want to be doctors. Um, maybe they'll never leave their village, but um, they have dreams and they feel like they can actually um, not only aspire, but, but achieve those dreams. And it's all about the next generation. This goes back to work <coughs> equals peace. You've got to provide enough, of, enough stability for the next generation to know something besides 35 years of war. So this is a little um, uh, snippet into our preschool. to the principal of the government school, he says that the Arzu preschool graduates are the stars of the first grade. So we know they'll be the valedictorians. And here's the ceremony of our first graduating class. Um, paper mortar boards and handmade certificates, but it's important, and this is another learning, to celebrate the small victories. Because in a place like Afghanistan, it's the only way they come. And that's another sort of universal learning that I've gained through this project is that um, big, top-down, scaled, international development, gazillions of dollars pouring in. I call that fire hose funding. Tsunami, earthquake. You take the fire hose, you aim it at very parched earth. Well, what happens to most of it? Runs off and breeds corruption. 
So we are the drip irrigation to fire hose funding. Um, we've also, through private um, uh, support, created several infrastructure projects. One of them is um, Central Park in um, the middle of the provincial capital. Um, this was actually funded by the Japanese government. Um, this is a band shell, and the park was under construction, and the governor came across the street and asked the workers if they could kind of move stuff out of the way because the vice president of Afghanistan was coming and there was no place to hold a meeting. 2,000 people came to hear this political discussion. That is progress in a new democracy. We have two women's centers where we have our classrooms, we have tea rooms. My personal favorite, we have the only stall showers in the province and laundry. The alternative to that is chipping through frozen ice uh, to do your clothes. The preschools, one of the preschools located in the garden center. And you can tell by the landscape around this area that this is really a Garden of Eden. Be it's not, but through hand watering, this is where we teach women cottage gardening skills, how they can grow their own nutritious fruits and vegetables for their children. And we have an operating principle that cannot plug in. That's our starting point. No matter what we try to do, it can't plug in. So we found this dehydrator um, on a website at the University of New Mexico. Now, one of the biggest um, shortcomings is lack of housing. So in our immediate area, we have 300 families, primarily widowed families, living in caves. So we started to experiment with a type of earth, rammed earth building uh, that was developed by a scientist at NASA. And we built what we call our mini housing development. This is super adobe. Because it's earth, compressed, 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 it retains, it has properties like old fashioned adobe from 500 years ago. It's warmer in the winter cooler in the summer. It's uh, waterproof um, because the traditional mud brick building, they don't get a lot of rain here, but when the snow melts, if it happens to come through your street, you're wiped out. Um, and here's one of the first, the insides are much more spacious than the outside looks. But I want to tell you the story of Donia. Um, Donia is a 60-year-old widow, and here she's sitting proudly inside her new super adobe home. And it's a world of difference from the hillside cave that she had lived in for years. The home is more than just a roof and walls. For Donia, it symbolizes a new start to life that has been riddled with hardship. Her father was killed in war when she was nine, leaving behind a widow with three little girls. At age 10, her uncle forced Donia into marriage with a 50-year-old man. And so by 30, she was a widow with her own three children. When the Taliban came in and destroyed everything they had, they fled in the night through the mountains, not to Pakistan, not to Pakistan, just up into the hills. She says, my children were hungry. All I had to feed them was the shrubs from the mountains. I was scared, but what could I do? I had nowhere to go except to run. So life in the, the hills was very difficult. Donia was an illiterate widow with no way to earn an income. Her two oldest children labored in fields, making a little money if they could, and stealing food when they could, risking their lives to do so, so that they could feed their mother and sister. She says, life was very hard at this time. We were nobody. When the Taliban was defeated, I took my family back across the mountains. I longed for my life back with my own people. But with the village destroyed and floods of refugees returning and displaced persons, um, coming home was not what she had dreamed. She says, the only place we could find to live was in the mountain caves. While I had never felt much of an existence, now I was even less. We lived like animals. Everyone knew. My children were shunned. All of our lives ruined. Then a miracle happened. A home was built for me. She was selected by the mayor to live in one of the dozen homes that Arzu built. And she says, now my daughter and I go to the Arzu Women's Community Center right next to our new home. My daughter's attending literacy classes. We have met many other women there. Finally, we have a community. And finally, I am a person. So a couple of years ago, 
Um, we talked, I won't say conned, we talked six iconic global architects into designing modern patterns and gifting them to us. One of them was local Southern Californian Frank Gehry. And I think he sums up um, a lot of the feeling of the uh, interlocking nature of, uh, of, the, our, of our world and our project. A lot of the great art being made in the Middle East today is being made by women. Probably because they're the most oppressed. I understood that Afghanistan is a country that's struggling. I knew there must be craftspeople there that were extraordinary. We can overcome a lot of the misunderstanding by communicating through the arts. We're not recognizing that enough. This is a way to open the door to their expression and hopefully help change the equation for the better. And finally, I'll end on this with this picture. This is not the picture, the Steve McCurry famous um, National Geographic picture. This is a rug that Steve McCurry asked us to weave. Um, this picture, this iconic picture, has become a folk art in Afghanistan and in many shops. Uh, school children draw copies of it. Uh, shopkeepers put it in their windows. And so over the years, Steve and his sister have collected different examples of it and they wanted a, 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 they wanted a version in, because of the meaning of rugs to Afghanistan. And when our weavers wrote, wove this rug, we were told that they got to the eyes and they slowed down because they wanted to make them perfect because of the meaning of this to them. So I'm gonna conclude my program there, but I wanna end on this note. Um, I think that um, as I said, service is a very critical, important, uh, critical, plays a critical role here, as does um, faith. And I think that I can truly say, having known nothing about Islam before I started working in Afghanistan, and I know a fair amount now, but I am a better Christian today because of my association with people of great faith. Many of these people have nothing but their faith. And then the last thing I'll leave you with is my very favorite quote by Eleanor Roosevelt, who said, it's not enough to talk about peace. You have to want it. It's not enough to want peace. You have to work at it. So everyone in this room, pebble in the pond, get to work. Thank you. Okay, well it looks like the students who've had to leave have left and so I'm all I'm all ears. Any questions? I'd be happy to answer anything I can. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for what you're doing. It's, uh, thank you for what you're doing. It's it's really wonderful. Yes. Thank you. And uh, I agree with you about job and I hope I wish the United States spent more money in getting job for the people there than throwing bombs which is you know, didn't work. Uh, I want to ask you, you have a great experience with Wall Street and working and management. Have you thought about teaching some of the women there management and business because I think they needed that because your talent in business is you could put all this small talent into something. So I think if you create a management class or management group, I think it will be wonderful. So I don't know if you have think about it and what do you think? Thank you for your question. Um, we, from the very beginning, um, and now let me couch this in the, from the context that I didn't know anything about international development practices when I started this. I didn't know anything about rugs, and I didn't know anything about Afghanistan. I just jumped in and so started to swim. But I've learned a lot about all three of those things, and that's why I have such strong feelings about the fact that our standard 
large international development practices needs a complete restructuring. It is ineffective, it is costly, it wastes money, and I think it's, it borders on immoral because of the waste of resources when there are so many people um, in need. But from the very beginning, again, not knowing any better, I just assumed that if I were going to create uh, uh, an enterprise in Afghanistan, it should be run by Afghans. And so we put out uh, unknowingly a, a, a job description for a country director um, and wanted an Afghan. And the applicants told us it was the first time they'd ever seen a job description where the boss was going to be an Afghan. Because in traditional international development practices, you parachute in the expats at tax-free, inflated income, pay them full expenses, you get the month R&R, &R, you know, you get the white suburban with the logo and the guard and all, you know, on and on and on. And so um, our first country director who really does the rug production side is a man because the rug production part of it um, and the uh, shipping and all that is, is a male-oriented function. He's still with us 10 years later. And once he fully learned English, fully learned management techniques, which was all on the job training, painstaking training, um, he was try the embassy tried to poach him, the World Bank tried to poach him. Um, I mean, an English speaking trained manager um, who, oh, by the way, happens to be Afghan. And he turned down jobs at multiples of what we could afford to pay him. And the reason he did that is because he saw every day the impact that the drip irrigation system has. So today, we have a full-time US staff of four people, two part-time people, me, and I don't get paid, and 55 people in Afghanistan who run all aspects of the, everything from the lady who manages the women's center. So we try to develop skills at every turn. We have a saying, no job is too small. In a country that's long labor, and short opportunities. We have, a, you know, we have people that open and close doors. No job is too small to instill pride. Another question? Yes. Uh, I was interested in your work uh, as it relates to self-sustaining or self-paying -pay loans. Uh, we're working now in some areas where women are providing loans to each other on a very small scale, but they're able to create these. Uh, what do you think of that? Well, this may sound a little heretical, but the, uh, I, I am a little bit of a heretic on the topic of um, microcredit. When uh, Muhammad Yunus, uh, I think it was in, what, 2009 or 10, um, won the Nobel Prize, it was declared the UN Year of Microcredit. Um, and I think it works very well at what I would call the upper strata of the urban poor. So in an Indian large city where someone can start a catering business and take it around to offices and actually have a market for their products. Where I do not think it's worked and it has failed in Afghanistan is when you're working with very, um, very bottom of the barrel, I mean bottom of the pyramid poor, um, for whom there is no market for their goods. And I'll give you some ex examples, because we've tried a number of what I call micro enterprises um, to create goods for local market consumption. And these were goods that were really needed, like biosand water filters to filter dirty river water and make it into clean water. Um, low carbon burning fuel briquettes that we learned to make uh, through a process that somebody else invented, um, where I did a deal with the US Embassy and I said, what do you do with your shredded paper? They said, we put in a landfill. I said, well, can I have it? And so we did that for years until they decided they were gonna sell their paper to somebody else um, who probably dumped it in a landfill. Um, so we've tried, a no we tried small bakeries, we've tried a number of these things, and at the end of the day, we have turned them into community service activities. Uh, people need heat, they need clean water, but they simply cannot afford even the pennies to pay for it. So um, I think it's a mixed bag, and I think it depends on where you're aiming that arrow. It is an arrow in the quiver. It just mean it just depends on where you're aiming it. Yes. And I see from the large clock I have two minutes left, so maybe this should be. 
Okay, well, if we have more questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm curious what cultural barriers and factors you came across while establishing ARSU that caused you to have to rethink your model? <laughs> That is a really good question because I learned our, we rethought our model about three weeks into it. Um, and that's when some, I, something in a report format came in and it was so off what we were expecting that rather than being disappointed, it was like the light bulb went off and I had to completely shift my set of expectations. And this is why, again, I think externally imposed solutions are really difficult um, to be absorbed because people in different cultures work from different sets of assumptions. And you really have to be, you really have to understand what those perspectives are. And I, I really try very hard to understand, and there's a lot of things I still just don't get. That's why we have an all-local staff. But now we, we've develop some operating principles. One is um, we always expect that no matter what we do, it will not work the first time. And that can be anything from here's a new report format to here's a super adobe building. It will not work. Then when something actually does work, we're like, wow, we hit that out of the park. Um, so that's you know, one of them, time, uh, time to get things done. Time is very elastic and you have to be accepting of that. Um, there are about 40 different ethnic groups in Afghanistan, tribes, very tribal culture, with a tribal um, governance structure, local governance first, provincial governance, and federal government is way off in the distance somewhere. And they have different, they're all, they're all uh, Muslim, but they're, they have, they're all along a spectrum from highly conservative, and in the case of the Taliban, fundamental, you know, radical fundamentalists, to the group that we work with. Uh, we work with the Hazara tribe, and who read The Kite Runner, that book about Afghanistan? Well, if you remember the story, there was a servant family. That, were, they were Hazara. And there's no cla uh, caste system in Afghanistan, but if there were, it, they'd be like the untouchables. So they have been the dog that everyone has kicked for a millennium. And that's one of the, that was one of the attractions of working with them because we went where nobody else was. You don't have a lot of competition that way for your product, which in our case were services. Um, so um, because of their uh, stature in society, we found them to be incredibly hardworking and an open and flexible. You know, a, a teenage boy and a teenage girl can be in the same room, not alone, but with other people. That's acceptable. Uh, families can go to the park together, mixed. Uh, genders. But some of the stuff you honestly just can't make up. We, we uh, started in a new village and we hired, uh, we have to hire two for most jobs because it's a gender segregated society. So you need a female to talk to women and you need a male to do male jobs. And so we started in this new village and we were getting these reports back and we're reading them and we're like, what is going on? We've explained this, we've gone through it with them. You know, it's like, what are they not talking to each other? Well, yes, that was exactly what was happening. They were not related, and therefore they could not talk to each other in a public place, which meant they submitted completely different reports on the same topic. So we solved that problem by hiring her nephew, and he actually turned out to be a regional manager over time, but uh, then the three of them could sit together and talk. But you know, again, who knew? Um, we didn't. So now we know a lot more of those kinds of nuances, um, but I'm, I'm never, I never fail to be a surprise. But I think, again, it's, uh, you know, if the Martian landed here and saw some of the stuff we do, they'd be shaking their heads too, so. Yes? I help run a school for over 600 little Afghan refugee guy, uh, girls outside of Peshawar in UN-run refugee camps. And we have them learn sewing and embroidery. But I think this might be very interesting if we could figure out some way to do the weaving. And how, how at what age did the little girls start weaving? Or do they have to be big girls? Now, weaving is a, is a tradition that's really passed, you know, 
from generation to generation. And just like my mother taught me to sew, mm -hmm. girls are taught to weave very young. This is where you get into this real complex issue of child labor. And that's why the, the uh, rug industry is, such, is known as such a brutally exploitive industry because um, you know, the kids start weaving when they're five or six years old and they do nothing else but weave. And so the way we attack the child labor problem is because we, we don't have child labor. We, that's just one of them. We uh, abide by the International Labor Organization standard that it defines a child through age 15. So um, we, we accomplish that by the requirement that the kids be in school full time. And then after school, if their mother wants to teach them to weave, that's their family's prerogative. Again, my mother taught me to sew. Um, you know, we mowed the lawn, those kinds of things, where it's a, a, a household job or training versus a you know, 10, 12, 14 hour a day activity. Um, I will say that um, you know, what I think the kids really want to learn, and I think that the sewing and embroidery skills are fabulous. Um, embroidery in particular. The problem is, at least where we are in Afghanistan, there's not a lot of market for those products and those goods, so they don't produce a lot of money. And I would, one, way, one area you may consider training them in is the computer. We've done that. Yeah, see that's, that opens their eyes to the world. It gives them a skill that they can deploy in, in many other ways. And um, weaving, is something that many of our weavers did learn in the refugee camps because they were there so long, that the, the adults. But um, unless it's, and this is just a personal opinion, if it's not already a family tradition where the mother and the aunts are not learning at the same time, I think it may be difficult for a girl to learn to weave in, an, in isolation. Yeah. It's now, just an opinion. These girls are all pastooned. Are they pastooned weavers? Um, the Pashtun people are primarily in the south and the east part of the country, and um, they are not big weavers. They are known for their embroidery, the Kandahar okay. embroidery, which actually looks the same on both sides. It's quite exquisite. I and I even tried to figure out, I was thinking, gosh, maybe Freda Linens would you know, send us strips of very fine Egyptian cotton that we could just have these, <laughs> these you know, women just do the Kandahar embroidery. Um, I think they mainly use silk, the, although they are beginning to use synthetics. They do a lot of synthetic cloth, yeah. and that's what happens also. That's part of the mission of our, um, our cultural uh, sustainability, is that what happens in so many cases is that the innate, in, in most emerging countries, there's a real skill set, whether it's beading, fine beading work in Africa, or basket weaving, or whatever it might be. Um, however, it gets interpreted as what I call kind of a tribal souvenir, and, um, and then the, the sort of synthetic and artificial materials come into play, and then it becomes the tribal souvenir that nobody wants. So um, we, you know, we try to keep it as authentic as possible. Thanks. Question? Yes? Has, um, has this experience... Um has this experience um, given you any different perspective on business in the U.S.? I mean, I think about issues related to income inequality here, um, just the kind of model that you've taken over there. Is that translatable here in some way? Well, I think the model, I really believe that this uh, sort of holistic model for poverty alleviation, it, trying to uh, figure out a way to let people escape the trap of poverty is really hard. And so I have concluded that it starts with a job. That's number one. You can be illiterate and still you know, have all the benefits of an income. Um, but you have to wrap it in these other life skills um, so that you end up with this holistic movement out of poverty. But I think the principles and the protocols that we've developed, I mean, if we can get this dog to hunt in the middle of nowhere Afghanistan, it would work on the south side of Chicago. It wouldn't be the same product, but you just have to figure out a way to employ people. Um, but in terms of income equality, I think seeing people rise from poverty, I mean, and you've heard some of the stories. These are just three representative examples, and we've got 80, 100, 200 stories. Um, what I see 
is the dignity that work provides and the uplift and satisfaction of having, of not having charity, of having your own means. And so if anything, my work in Afghanistan with the bottom of the barrel in terms of economic class has just simply reinforced my belief that uh, free enterprise and private sector activity is absolutely the way out of poverty. People will work for themselves. They will work, if there is a ray of hope that their children can have a better life than they do, they will do whatever it takes to make that happen. And it is nothing short, I am in awe of these people, it's nothing short of astonishing. So I uh, am not a believer in um, you know, the, the leveling of uh, inequitable uh, economic distribution. Yes, you need a safety net. Yes, you absolutely need services that support, that give people the basic, you know, you look at Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs. What do people need to live? Okay, first order needs. They need food, they need water, they need air, they need reasonably constant temperature, which means clothes and housing. Okay, that's, until that is met, they cannot think about second order needs. Well, guess what one of the second order needs is? It's called security, but I call that peace. So if people are starving and cold, and their children are dying of hunger, which we've had a number of examples of. We've had kids that, you know, during Taliban days, literally froze to death in their parents' arms. Until you address that stuff, which is this grassroots economic engagement, um, you can't get people to elevate from that, but this is the way at it. I will say there was, um, I would say probably around the 2009, 2010 era, there was, when, when um, before the surge was deployed and there was a lot of what they call kinetic activity, meaning you know, warfare going on, especially in the Pashtun areas, southern Afghanistan, I actually had the uh, amazing opportunity to um, be invited by the commanding general of the surge to go to Helmand province. And it started because somebody on his staff had read an article about Arzu in the LA Times. And it was about Arzu and Greg Mortensen, who had not fallen from grace yet. And I'm fully confident that they called Greg Mortensen first, and he couldn't come. So then they called Connie Duckworth, but she could come. And, uh, but I was actually very honored to go. So I went to Pendleton, and I spent a day down there, and I met all kinds of people. And, and what they were really interested in is when you have when the area is too dangerous to have anybody but military boots on the ground, because the USAID people won't go in. The NGOs can't operate in the middle of a war zone. It's impossible. You know, what can the military do? So um, that's what led to this embedding with the Marines in, in 130 degree weather. And again, fear of heights, fear of flying. Um, going out every single day to the tarmac and getting on something else really cool, like an Osprey, um, Hueys, Chinooks, always with the doors open and guys hanging out. And then in those like Hurt Locker Humvees where you get in and the guy says, do not place your feet on the floor, place them on the metal plate in front of you. And I'm like, ah, okay. But it was an amazing uh, experience to see this. Um, but uh, this led to the military thinking for a brief period of time about a topic called, that was being called expeditionary economics. And this is how in a war zone do you train military to instill grassroots economic activity. And they didn't stay long on that topic, quite frankly, but I think it was a very relevant one because I think it was exactly the right question. I was then invited to participate at West Point in a conference on this, and Arzu was used as an exhibit of how this might happen. Um, but I do believe that it takes more than guns. It takes more than butter. It takes mm -hmm. actually that slow, patient seating and the realization that nothing is going to happen fast. And I think that's one of our main problems. We expect results quickly and you cannot tackle these enormous problems in any kind of a fast fashion. It's like watching paint dry. 
Maybe one last question. Yes, sir. Um, I'm wondering if you would comment, given the gender dynamics of Afghan culture, um, have any of the women in Arzu who have experienced empowerment and liberation also experienced some level of challenge either in their families or in culture? I wonder if you'd comment on that. Well, the question, it's a very good one, is you know, how do the men take this and do, you get, do they get pushback either from the village or from other men? And this is another one of these amazing experiences or lessons that I've learned through this process. I really have come to believe that when you strip away the economic and cultural and religious differences, at their core, people are pretty much the same. And when a man see, who is illiterate, because we've tried to get men into literacy classes, but a teacher is a very respected position in Afghanistan. And so for a man to acknowledge that he cannot read and to come in and to be taught as an adult is a very, considered a very humiliating um, uh, thing. And so we just don't, we have been unsuccessful with that, whereas the women will come in and, and learn. But I've seen these dads, when their child gets a certificate, again, we give them out for a lot of things. Um, and, you know, we'll have pictures. And here's the proud dad. It's like he's holding the Little League trophy with the child. And I think that is this natural parenting instinct. I think people want their children to, to progress and to do better. And interestingly, our women have had no pushback. Um, at all. In fact, the men who are really, for the most part, unemployable, not because they're not willing, but you saw the pictures, there's no water. And so they can't do agriculture, and agriculture is the main employer of very poor emerging countries, always is. And they can't do that. So they just don't. There's nothing for them to do. And so, um, but I'll, I'll close with one uh, humorous story. It's sort of the, uh, the honey-do kind of story. Um, when our weavers weave, they weave in a line, and the master weaver sits on the left. And if it's a small rug, there might be two people sitting there. And these are done in the household, except for the very large commercial looms, which we have to put in our two-story women's center. And so if a large rug, there might be five people working on it. But if that master weaver gets up for any reason to go uh, do a household chore, or to feed a child, or whatever, everybody stops, because in a way, she's kind of setting the cadence for the whole line. So uh, one of our staff was in one of the homes. We're in the homes all the time. And um, the weaver was getting up to go fetch something, you know, water, wood, whatever it might be. And her husband, who was in the room, said, no, no, honey, you keep doing what you're doing, and I will go fetch that. And when we heard that story, that is a small victory. Um, anywhere in the world. So um, <laughs> that's why I say people are much more the same than they are different. Thank you so much.